right, we're in part two of the Gospel of John. Two weeks ago, when you guys were with us, we studied the passage that said, in the beginning was the Word. And we discovered that this Word, this Logos, was with God. And not only was this Logos with God, we uncovered the truth that the Word was God. And one of the last things John, the author, finished with was the testifying and the testimony of John the Baptist of this word. Well, in this, mo- this morning, as we continue life in his name, the series we've dedicated to this gospel, we're gonna see the reality that many will reject Jesus. But we're also gonna see the perks and privileges of what it means to receive Jesus. The reality that you are either for or against him And we're going to see that Jesus is not just a myth or an idea or an association with what we identify as Jesus to be, what what a biblical look of who the person of Jesus Christ is, that he came in the flesh and dwelt among us. So we actually have a lot to cover. So let's go to verse 10 of John chapter 1. It says this. John continues and says, He was in the world... And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. So John points out three things in this single verse that should be noted, that we should look at. That number one, he was in the world. Number two, the world was made through him. And sadly, even though he was visiting the very place he created, the third fact of verse 10 is the world didn't know him. I used to love watching the show Undercover Boss. Do you guys remember that show? It came out in 2010. I just found out they canceled the show last year. They stopped making it in 2022. Some of you are very sad at that statement. You'll get over it. Anyway, so um, if you've never seen the show, basically the CEO, the president of whatever major company goes undercover in his own company. He, He comes up with a different identity to not reveal who he is or who she is. And and they are doing this as a means to kind of see what's happening within their own company, see how more specifically their employees are conducting themselves. And some of the episodes are just painful to watch because you watch these employees completely bash the company, completely bash the CEO, the president, or whoever it might be, and they don't even know it. They have no idea that their boss is right in front of them. And that is until the end that the CEO, the president, the one going undercover reveals himself. And then, of course, the facial expressions from the employees are just in utter shock. And it's priceless. In fact, I don't remember which pastor did this. I read years ago that a pastor dressed up as a homeless person to kind of see how his congregants would react and respond to a homeless person coming to the church and, and I think it was like kind of this sad reality because he revealed himself at the end and, you know, kind of rebuked his church that essentially they didn't welcome love and uh, minister to that homeless person. Which, by the way, if I ever tried to attempt such a thing, like the staff would figure it out. They'd be like, who's the bearded guy in the back? And they'd be like, it's John again. And I'd be like, I'm not John. <laughs> it would be me. They'd figure it out. There was this one episode, though, on Undercover Boss that the, uh, the CEO of Model Sporting Goods reveals himself to the employee and he tells the person, I'm giving you $50,000 and I'm paying the taxes on it. Money's yours. I'm writing you a check right now. And the person, because normally when stuff like that happens in the show, they are, oh my goodness, thank you so much. But this person, I, I remember the statement they made and said, $50,000? That kind of money is going to save my life. I was thinking about this in relation to this passage of scripture where we're at. Because for Jesus, which is even better, he did pay off our debt. He paid off the very debt he knows we can't afford, that we ourselves cannot, within a f- multiple lifetimes, pay off. He saved our life. And even with this knowledge, some of you know that, and you're like, praise the Lord, yes, absolutely, he he saved me. But even with this knowledge, we can find this life in his name 
possibility. We can find hope. We can find forgiveness and purpose should bring us to our knees because Jesus is the CEO of life, if you will. He came to the world that he created, to humanity that was made in his image, but the reality of verse 10 is the world did not know him. I mean, can you imagine? In fact, in Luke's gospel, we're told after Jesus rose from the dead that two of the disciples were conversing among one another, they were walking, and they were talking about essentially what has happened had happened between uh, they knew Jesus died, they knew he was buried, they found out that the stone had been rolled away, they knew Jesus wasn't in the tomb, and they're wondering what happened, where is he, what does this mean? But little did they know that resurrected Jesus was going to pull an undercover boss, right? And in fact, listen to this, Luke chapter 24, verse 15 through 16, here are the disciples, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Again, Jesus, he's pulling an undercover boss. That's where the show got the idea, by the way. You're welcome. Anyways, and he's noticing that they're sad. He, he knows what they're talking about. And he, he knew that they were talking about this, you know, how the prophet would come, that the chief priests arrested and crucified him. And the disciples, they're even going to say, you know, we thought he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And they began telling undercover boss Jesus, and you know, what makes matters worse is that Jesus has been dead for three days and his body's missing now. Now listen to what Jesus told them, even though they still have no idea it's him. Luke 24, 25 through 27, Jesus said to them, You foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Uh, Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself which in and of itself had been amazing, but in and of itself had been weird for the disciples because they still don't know it's Jesus. And yet here's this random guy explaining, you knew this was gonna happen. The prophets spoke of this. Here, this is what it said. And just the fact of the matter, in that they didn't know it was him, they decide to go to the next village with this mysterious man and then something rad happens. Luke 24, 30 through 31, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed and broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. Look at this last part. And they they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Whoa. Guys, I, I, I literally can't wait till we get to the end of the Gospel of John, and some of you are like, yeah, in a couple of years, like Exodus, but anyways. Um, Just this passage, just imagining that happened. But did you catch what was written before Jesus vanished? Their eyes were opened and they knew it was him. I want you to think for a second, maybe you grew up in a Christian home, maybe you didn't. Maybe you became a Christian as an adult or as a kid or as a teen, or some of you, you still haven't given your life to the Lord. But do you remember that moment, that beautiful moment when your eyes are open and you finally understand who Jesus is? And not only this, this beautiful moment of understanding who Jesus is, that this joy finally comes into your life because you understand and can see the light of the world. You understand that the Redeemer who loves you, Jesus, is in fact God. And it's just, it's, it's, it's indescribable. Because you're brought to this place of just like, I don't deserve it though. And yet you're just so thankful. And I've come to realize, especially after doing this for 20 years full time next year, the truth is that your eyes can see the truth and yet you can still choose to reject it. And the reality is because sin blinds us from the truth. I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in the Christian home. I should, by very nature, understand what it means and embrace 
the doctrine of who Jesus Christ is, but I didn't, and I didn't want anything to do with him. I wasn't ready to give up everything that I loved, or at least I thought I loved, and, and this is what I'm talking about. Sin blinds us from the truth. In fact, you're going to see what I mean. Look at verse 11 of John 1. He came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. Now, the, the Greek words behind this single verse are so fascinating. In fact, the first time, this is the first time the Greek word translated his own is used in this verse, and it was referring to creation. And the second time, it was in the form of, a, in, in the masculine form, referring to humanity. So if you read verse 11, he came to his own, first time it's used, referring to creation, now the second time, and his own, masculine term, referring to humanity, did not receive him. Now, the reason why this is amazing, because in other words, Jesus came into the world and all of creation acknowledged him, meaning the winds obeyed him. The water supported him. The rocks are ready to cry out to him. But there was one segment of creation that didn't receive him. Humanity. Human nature. Listen, guys, let this, let this sink in. Human nature is the only part of nature and creation that can refuse to worship God. And I want you to think about that because Worshiping is not an odd concept. It doesn't, for, it's not like it doesn't come naturally to me, but it actually does. We're actually really good at worshiping. We're good at worshiping sports teams, movie stars, rock stars. We have no difficulty of understanding worship. But when it comes with Jesus, it, it's awkward. When it comes to Jesus, our arms are folded and voices start to hush and our posture isn't that of humility it's just I'm, I'm i'm upset the music's too loud i don't know this song why don't we sing enough hymns here why does john have so many tattoos honey that doesn't have to do with worship i know but i just like complaining right now but seriously why why does it not come so naturally to us because the reality is we have the choice and i want to i want to dig a little deeper on this concept of what free will is. But thankfully, not everyone has rejected Jesus. And if you've, by the way, if you've never given your life to the Lord and you're here and you're visiting church or you're watching online later and you've never understood what it means to be a Christian, verse 12 is gonna be the most encouraging thing you will hear. Verse 12, but, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. John Corson once said, praise God for the word, but. How many great truths swing on this small hinge? I was blind, but now I can see. I was lost, but now I've been found. I didn't understand who Jesus was, but now I know he's my creator. Those great words, that singular word, but as many as received him. And you know what that means? That, that this is telling me a court, that verses 11 and 12 means you have a choice. You can either choose to reject Jesus, or as verse 12 says, you can choose to receive Jesus. And I want you, guys, I, I, I want to, Focus on this for a second. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the concept that you can or you are be adopted into the family of God. And the moment, as verse 11 puts it, receive him and believe in his name, you're a part of this heritage, this, this beautiful family legacy. But I want you to notice, because this is where a lot of churches kind of misuse the word, or maybe you've accidentally done this, I want you to notice in your Bible how it doesn't say to those who accept Jesus. Because we, we hear that a lot. You just got to accept Jesus. You got to do it. You just got to accept him. And yet, verse 12 says we have to receive Jesus. 
Meaning Jesus doesn't need our accepting response because he has already accepted you. Do you realize that? But that, we don't think like that. We think in like a social media terms. I finally accepted Jesus' friend request online. He just seemed needy and I'm just, all right, I'll be your friend. It's like Jesus has already accepted us. Let me, give, let me preface this some more. Ephesians 1, 6. To the praise of glory of his grace by which he made us, look, accepted in the beloved. This couple of weeks ago when we were in Jordan, Carolyn and I celebrated 18 years of marriage. And I remember when I was asking Richard Perea, who was at the time my girlfriend's father, permission to marry Carolyn. What I didn't do when I talked to Richard, I wasn't like, all right, Here's how it's going to go, Richard. I suppose I'll accept you guys as family now. You're welcome. Because he would punch me in the face and say, stay away from my daughter, right? Listen, but rather, Carolyn's father accepted me and allowed me to be received into the family. He's the one who gave permission. He's the one who allowed me to be a part of this. We receive Jesus. Jesus has already accepted us. That's why the Bible says that God desires that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. This idea, this concept that he, he's already accepted you. He's already died for you. But will you receive the free gift of salvation? Will you be a part of the family of God, adopted into the family of Christ? Because Jesus has already chosen you before the foundations of the world, according to the Bible. The question is, will we receive the free gift of salvation? Because what we're reading here in, in John chapter 1, that those who choose to receive the free gift of salvation have to believe, you must believe in the name of Jesus, that he is the only one that can remove your sin, and it's to them, according to verse 12, he gives the right to be adopted children of God. Now let this next thing sink in. You ready? God can't choose for you even though he chose and accepted you already. He can't do it for you. And I know this, there's this weird argument online, why would a loving God send people to hell? Because the very nature of God requires that you choose to worship him. In the same way, I think the argument could be said the same way, that God doesn't forcefully grab you and take you into heaven. You, you see what I mean? It's this idea that like, he's already died for you, he loves you. And in his foreknowledge, he knows those who will reject or receive this free gift. He can't choose for you, even though he chose you and accepted you already. In fact, when the children of Israel were being disobedient, God gave them a choice too. Listen to this, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. God says, today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses, and I call unto heaven and earth to witness the choice that you will make. And you'd think it would just end right there. That his foreknowledge knows who's going to reject this warning or receive this warning. But I love the end of verse 19. Look what God's rooting for you to choose. Look, don't, don't miss this. I witnessed, I'm calling on heaven to witness the choice you make and oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. I love that verse. I love that verse because how often do we feel like we don't deserve it? As if God's gonna be like, well, you really don't deserve it, so I guess I'll accept you into the family of God. He's looking at you even in, in, in this rebellious former life we used to be in, and he says, I, I'm witnessing the choice you make, and oh, that you would choose life, choose life, so that you and your descendants may live. And you can make the choice, how do we choose life? You can make the choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. In our text here in John chapter one, he came to his own, his own did not receive him. And that's the weird reality, is that Jesus knows the ones that will reject him versus the ones that will receive this free gift. And I love that he, he's rooting for us to choose life. 
In fact, it comes down to this. God offers redemption through the cross. He offers to pay your debt in full because he knows we can't do it. We can't do it through good works. We can't do it by coming to church and having this religious checkoff list. Here's even the crazier thing. We don't even earn it by memorizing scripture. I want to memorize scripture. I want to hide his word in my heart, but that's not, that's not the, the fundamental requirement to save me. And as difficult and yet as simple as it might sound, life boils down to those two very things. You can reject Jesus or you can receive Jesus. And some of you might come up to me afterwards and be like, well, there's a third option, actually. I remain undecided about Jesus. I have nothing against him. I just haven't made up my mind. But the reality is, is you have made up your mind. That, that, the, the, that choice in and of itself is revealing your position because Jesus is the one who said, you, you, you either are for me or against me. We can't have this mentality that we can serve two masters at the same time. By choosing to be undecided, we've actually chosen and made the decision to reject Jesus. In fact, last thing I want to point out in verse 12 before we move on, the promise to those who receive Jesus, it says... It says, we then have the right to become children of God. Now, when we get to the third chapter of John, we're going to see Jesus having this conversation uh, with Nicodemus. And they're going to cover the subject of rebirth. Or maybe some of you have heard it in church, being born again. I was born again. Meaning those who have been added to the Lamb's book of life adopted into the family of God. It becomes a spiritual representation of the transformation of the new birth. I was old in my ways and I'm new in who I am in Christ. It's this beautiful inner transformation that takes place. In fact, this is what John was elaborating in relation to becoming a child of God. Look at verse 13. Those who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, this is an important verse, primarily because John is reminding how the spiritual transformation takes place when you become a child of God, whether for some of you it was this last week, last month, last year, decades ago. Because keep in mind, a Christian is not like, you know, becoming a Christian isn't like inheriting a name or a property. It's not about, you know, people, it, it, I can't even begin to tell you how many families I've met that are in the religion that they're in because their family's family were in that religion. It's, and it's not even this, this relational understanding of who Christ is. It's just this, this is who I am. I mean, think about it. Here's another way to look at it. My dad's a pastor. My dad's been a pastor for decades, over three decades. I grew up in a Christian home, but just because I was born into a Christian family does not, nor does it secure my salvation. I'm not a Christian because I grew up in a Christian home. In fact, listen to this. The New Living Translation of John 1.13. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So this, this new birth, and again, we'll elaborate more on it when we get to the third chapter, is referring to the work that Christ does in us. Moving on to verse 14. This is a, this is, I love, this is a good one. Verse 14, the word became flesh, we all know it, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. When John was writing this gospel, there was a heretical teaching being presented concerning who Jesus was. It was fully against him. And the heretical teaching, maybe some of you know it, is known as Gnosticism. The Gnostics believed that, in a short summary, that material is defined as evil. They, they struggled with the fact that Jesus was God because he was flesh, he was material, he was organic. And the Gnostics promoted this weird concept that if Jesus was in fact God, you know, if he walked on the beach, there would be no footprints in the sand. Ooh. And it's, it's just, it's 
some of the things you hear are quite ridiculous. And what John is trying to do, especially in relation to the context of the time and what was being presented about Jesus, is to kind of refute that claim. In fact, John elaborated more on this in his other epistles. So we have the Gospel of John, and then we have 1st, 2nd, and uh, the 3rd Epistle of John. Listen to this. And this is what he's promoting. Okay, Jesus is organic, he's flesh, and he's also God. 1st John 1, 1 through 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, listen to this, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life of was manifested, we have seen, we bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. John is trying to relate a very important lesson at that time that Jesus was not a phantom. Sorry, Gnostics. No, no, no. He's fully God. He's fully man, which we know as the incarnation of Christ. And not only did Jesus come in the flesh and dwell among us as we're learning here in chapter one, but Paul also said something. He, he had a, also comment on it. Colossians 1.19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. The New Living Translation says, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. In fact, that word fullness in the Greek is pleroma. Everyone say plero pleroma. Yes, we're learning Greek in church. You're welcome. Pleroma is defined as the total divine attributes and power of deity within him. Meaning, and again, we can't fully wrap our mind around this, and we talked about this last time we were in John, that we're limited in understanding a perfectly all-knowing, has always existed God. But wrap your mind around this. Jesus, although he was man, was also overflowing with the fullness of God. Simple definition, he was God in skin. Which again, a lot of, as you can understand, especially for this time, the carpenter's kid from Nazareth is God. It was hard for them to wrap their mind around that. But that's exactly what it was. That God was packaged up into a body. And here's the crazy thing. It actually pleased him to do it this way. It brought joy to God to package Jesus in the form of a body, expressing to be fully God and man. And I suspect it was the same joy Jesus experienced when he was on the cross, that for the joy before him, he's going to endure the cross. So it makes sense why it pleased the Father that in Jesus, as we just read, all the fullness should dwell. In fact, Philippians 2 put it this way. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Now, th this is crazy to me. That Jesus decided to come to earth even though, human, even though the human body is defective And he decided, I don't care. I'm going to come anyways. I'm going to set these people free. And I just, a culture shock in and of itself. Because again, guys, we have to remember that, okay, like we know this, Jesus became a man, but he didn't lose his right of being God fully at the same time. In fact, J. Vernon McGee, you guys like J. Vernon McGee? He says, some, he's got good stuff. He's got gold. Listen to what he said. He didn't empty himself of his deity. He was God when he came to the earth. He only emptied himself of the glory that he had with the Father. So Jesus being fully man, fully God simultaneously. And what John is wanting his readers to understand that are looking at this, both Hebrew and Greek, is to understand the false teaching that was presenting Jesus in a downgraded way. And let me, I'll be more specific. It was a blasphemous downgrade concerning his deity. You guys, we had a couple Mormons come to our church the week we came back from Jordan. Did you know that? They introduced themselves to me, asked if we can get lunch. We got lunch this last Monday. Um, 
And, and I want to preface this before I tell the rest of the story. I'm praying for these guys still. But they asked me if I would like to participate in a, round ta- a pastoral round table in the community of pastors of all religions. You know what I told them? I said, I have no interest in being part of that round table. And they kind of looked shocked and I, and, and I, I said, but I, I have a high interest in getting to know you in discussing doctrine. What was difficult for me is that they claimed that we worshiped the same Jesus. And then through understanding the Book of Mormon and their doctrine of who Christ is, is that he was created and he shares a a hereditary gene being brothers with Satan. Did you know that the Mormons promote that? And so, you know, coming to them and and, and looking them in the eyes and saying, "I'm I'm not here to like be disrespectful to you and your family or you, but the reality is I can't participate in something that has downgraded who Jesus Christ is according to the Bible. And for us as a church, I'm always gonna promote a biblical understanding of who Christ is. And I'm looking at him and it's like, maybe you didn't come to our church by accident or coincidence. Maybe the Lord wanted you to have this meeting right now to understand who he is. And man, what if someone told you in this moment, everything you ever believed in was a lie, but the truth of being revealed, this revelation that now, now you can understand who Christ is. Wouldn't you wanna know? Pray for them, guys, because we're, we're gonna actually meet again. We, we came to a disagreement and the Lord reminded me of this important factor that even rational reasoning is not going to work with these guys. But you know what is gonna work? Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and by this they'll know you're my disciples. So my goal for meeting with them in the coming weeks is just to love them, just get to know them. So pray for me that I, my, Carolyn, I, I always hear my wife's voice in my head when I'm meeting with people, where I just hear Carolyn's voice saying, fix your face, fix your face, fix your face. Because <laughs> some of the absurdities that come out of people's mouths, like I want to be like, Fix your face, fix your face. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. All right, so. For John, he is trying to refute false claims of who Jesus, who Jesus was concerning what Gnostics were promoting. And for, for John, this was so important that they understood that he was perfectly God and also someone in the flesh who could perfectly relate with us. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Oh, I love that about my creator. I love that he's not just an empathizer from the side, like, I'm so sorry. He understands. He understands everything in all ways that I'm tempted in, in in ways in my weakness, in ways that I, in my human flesh, want to give up. And yet with Jesus, he was all of those, yet without sin. In fact, the Greek word, because I want you to notice in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Greek word dwelt literally means tabernacled or encamped, meaning Jesus chose to pitch his tent among us. Some of you hate camping, right? Have you ever thought about that? Maybe Jesus didn't like camping, but he chose to do it. He chose to be among us to camp in skin. We beheld his glory, verse 14 says, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Just as the Shabbat, which by the way means the glory of God. We see that. Remember when we studied through Exodus? Again, some of you are cringing when I say that, but no, this is good. Remember when we were studying through Exodus, we see in the tabernacle the glory of God this amazing revelation. But now the glory of God is seen in Jesus, in the flesh. And I want you to, guys, I want you to understand why this is such an amazing statement. That in the Old Testament times, only the high priests on the Day of Atonement dared to enter the Holy of Holies. We, we studied it extensively. And it was only then that they could behold the glory of God. And it was, even then it was limited But because of Jesus, now, his atoning work on the cross when he died, the veil is torn. 
You don't have to be a high priest to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now you can now behold the glory of God through Jesus. You can behold the glory of God through the reading of his word, through worship, through the fellowship of the saints, prayer. Isn't that amazing? You don't don't need me or the other pastors. You can go to your quiet place to behold the glory of God at home because the veil was torn and now we can behold his glory freely and intimately. Amen? Who else is excited about that? I am. That's why my job's replaceable. You guys don't need me. All right, verse 15. So it says this. John bore witness of him, cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, who comes after me and is preferred before me, for he was before me. I know some of you are wrapping your mind around like, what just happened there? Okay, think about what John the Baptist is saying. So John the author is writing what John the Baptist just said. He who comes after me, he's basically saying, uh, he, referring to Jesus, or I'm sorry, he, John the Baptist, was born before Jesus, approximately six months Jesus was born after. But then he says, but he's preferred before me for he was always before me? Wait a second. Again, it's hard. Wait, that doesn't make sense though. It's like John is saying, I was born before Jesus, but he's better than me because he was before me. Like you think this is a crazy family, like the the, Christ family, the cousins, all these guys are weird. But just as Jesus, if you remember the conversation that he was having concerning the subject of Abraham, Jesus basically said, Abraham was glad when he looked forward to my coming. And some of the listeners were like, wait, you met Abraham? You're not even over the age of 50, and you're saying you knew the guy? And Jesus' response is, yeah, before Abraham was, I am. Which was an audacious statement. It's basically code for before Abraham was even born, I existed. John understood this, which is why he says, he who comes after me is preferred before me because he was before me. And then look at verse 16. And of his fullness, we have all received grace for grace. Oh, it's kind of like the lyrics we were singing during worship today, right? It's beautiful just understanding that verse in and of itself. So now I wanna ask this question. It's rhetorical, so if you wanna say it out loud, you can, but here we go. Do you think it's possible for us to ever exhaust the grace of God? Some of you kind of might say hesitantly, I don't think so, (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) Yelled at my kids on the way to church today, so. um, Do you think we could ever annoy Jesus to the point that he would say, enough is enough, I'm done with your sin, I'm done with your stupidity, you guys are way too much to deal with. Do you think we'll ever bring Jesus to that point? No, some of you like confidently say that. (laughs) Nope, I'm stupid and Jesus still will receive me. (laughs) Do you guys think we could ever cause Jesus to regret dying for a generation of people that continue to reject him? Here's something to bake your noodle whether you're choosing to embrace the free gift that Jesus offers, or you choose to walk with him, or if you choose to reject and live a life of sin and scandal, the Bible says you are still being blessed having grace upon grace. Now let me preface a couple things before some of you talk to me afterwards. I think in order for you to understand the peace of God, you first have to embrace the grace of God. The true peace comes from giving your life to the Lord, and yet, isn't it also safe to say, before giving your life to the Lord, you did some stupid, horrendous things, and you look back, and you think, God was so gracious even when I was blind. Man, we blame God for so many things, and the fact that we're all here receiving the word, listening, watching this later, I don't think we can fully measure the grace of God. So I don't think there's any limit to exhaust God's grace, but I wanna say this one thing before we read the last verse, Romans 6, one through two. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we sin because we know grace is always available, Paul basically says, what does he say? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So here's what I'm gonna leave you with before we go to verse 17. 
the way you view Christ's sacrifice and the cost to save you will determine your view on sin. If it makes you mourn, or if you know that Christ is, has unlimited grace and you can just do whatever you want. And if that is you, you have a misunderstanding of what saved you. Just personalize it. What if your own father saved your life? And I'm not talking metaphorically. He, he saved your life. And maybe whatever happened was your fault. Whatever you did in that moment, are you going to go back to it, knowing the cost it took to save you? That your, your dad died for you, to save you in whatever situation that is. And, and I guess that's the point that I'm making. It makes you rethink. I know I'm a sin, sinner by nature, but I, I don't want to repeatedly get caught up in things that I know is going to hurt my Lord. So again, if we, dis, if we choose to sin and desire to sin over and over again because we know grace is unlimited, then we have a misunderstanding of grace and the cost it took us, took to save us. So verse 17, we're going to fly through this and invite the worship team up. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, what John is trying to relay here is draw this contrast between Jesus and Moses. We talked a ton about this when we studied through Exodus, that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law revealed sin, but Jesus is the one who removes it. The law showed us how we failed, but it could never save us, but Jesus could save us. And this is great because what John is doing is he's comparing the Old Testament covenant with the New Testament promise, the law versus grace. Paul put it this way, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they are. But as people sinned more and more, God's wondered kindness, wonderful kindness became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful kindness rules instead giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So praise God for this new covenant. And praise God for the law because it did reveal our sin, but it was Jesus who removed it. It was Jesus who became the undercover boss in order to prove, I want to I wanna dwell among you so you can see that I'm going to die for you. Last story I want to give. When I worked at Starbucks a decade plus ago, I worked with some amazing, dedicated hard workers. But I actually also worked with real class bums as well. And um, <clears throat> guys, I'm talking about lazy, painfully horrible employees, awful work ethics. I'm talking about like the kind of people that shouldn't drive cars, much less serve hot beverages to human beings. Like those kinds of people, you know who they are. Anyway, so, but the, the moment these people realized the district manager was coming to the store, everyone would panic because they knew they needed to change their work ethics. They knew that they needed to, to look good in front of the boss. And like she would come in and it was almost like everyone developed this British accent. And like she would walk in and be like, oh, good day, madam. What can I do and what service can I perform for the Duchess of Starbucks? And like she'd be like, ha ha ha, you're so good and creative. And I'm sitting there thinking like, you should do this all the time and just do your job well. They had pristine lattes, workstation was spotless for once. But the moment she left, these amazing workers became awful workers again. And that, not only that, they would talk bad about, behind her back. I couldn't, I couldn't believe some of the things I heard and the inconsistencies that I saw. I think most of you would agree if your boss was hovering over your shoulders while you worked, you would probably improve the way you work. Maybe some of you have no respect for your boss and you're like, I don't care what they can do, fire me. Probably, but anyways. Um, but here's a question. What if we did the same thing in life? Like seriously, what if we knew Jesus was watching us? He's watching every internet site you're going to, watching how you're spending your money, watching how you discipline and talk to your kids. He's watching how you represent him in front of your friends. So yeah, Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us but, but he never left us, you guys. 
This isn't an archaic promise we're looking back on and like, oh, I wish Jesus was still here. He, he's with us now. He's among us now. He gave us the promise of the Holy Spirit, a new helper now. In fact, when we approach the end of the chapter, we're going to see Jesus and Nathaniel have this conversation. And I want you to listen to what it says, and then I'm going to invite the worship team up. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of glory. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And I want to give you this last thought. In fact, we're going to read God's word together corporately. I thought this would be a fun thing to understand that Jesus sees everything we do, that Jesus is a perfect representation of what it means to be God and be God among us. In fact, I'm going to read seven verses with you guys, but what I want to do is, I, they're going to be on the screen. I want to read the odd verses, and I want you guys to read the even verses. So let's do this. Just in, in adoration for, and reverence for God's word, let's stand Let's stand together and let's finish with this final reading of God's word and understanding that he sees everything we do. So again, I'll read the odd verses. You guys read the even verses. Psalm 139, one through seven, I'll begin. Oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. I'm sorry, but the, hearing it from my perspective, it's like such knowledge is so wonderful to me. It's like, really though? Let's say that, let's do it one more time. We'll go read verse six again, but I want to hear it like non-robotic. <laughs> Got a little Pentecostal there. Verse seven, I'll finish it. <laughs> I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Jesus knows everything. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. We serve an amazing God, amen? Amen. Amen.